Hey everybody. I'm gonna start this like I do kind of all my stuff. Hey, I'm Greg Soul. Uh this is CIQ. Have one Your daughter. Oh, amazing introduction. I love it. <laughs> uh so I guess I mean for the most part we are uh automation guys. Uh you wanna do a little background? Where you where are you where are you kind of from? I mean, obviously not like geographically, nobody cares about that, but like technically, like what's your what's your backstory? Uh, so, I, you know, I started in automation pretty much at the beginning of my career, going from public to saw to uh, Ansible at one point, doing automation, whatever job I was in. So here at CIQ, I'm kind of an automation specialist on the center portion. And, you know, just running with that. Yeah. Jimmy and I actually go way back 2002. It was my first job out of college. Uh, met this cat. So uh, we've been working together for a really long time. And, uh, yeah, a lot of what we did was try to... Uh, automate things as much as possible so that we could play games we used to uh we had a lot of interesting games we played in the knock remember we played uh subspace. we played subspace yeah. we had uh, a big rubber bouncy ball and we played foursquare you remember that mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah we played foursquare we found if you automated everything it made your life so much <laughs> you could do so much more <laughs> yeah so much more of your time even if it wasn't a uh, work it was less about efficiency and more about the efficiency of our entertainment i think yeah yeah it's good times uh, but yeah, I, I think, uh, my background, I mean, you have a very, very background. A lot of it, a lot of it's what software dev, server software infrastructure, that kind of stuff. Server infrastructure, windows, Linux, uh, networking. I mean, pretty much across the board. I, I try to learn new stuff all the time. So I'm just always jumping in whatever's out there. Yeah. A lot of, I, I mean, think, I think you mirror this too. Um, a lot of what we did kind of, there's, there's this bottom line at the every, uh, at the bottom of every job description that says other duties as assigned and yeah. it's. It's basically, you do whatever is required, which to me is like exciting about working in a place like this because there are a lot of other duties that need to be uh, done and we get to just kind of uh, get in there and take care. I just said duties, which I think is really funny. You didn't even crack a smile. So I really appreciate it. I realized you're doing a video. Yeah, keeping it solid. Oh, if it had just been audio only? Yeah. Would, okay. Yeah, I get it. Anyway. Um, yeah, but we so we get to play with automation, a lot of our time and energy you for the what the last six seven years yep. a lot of time and energy into ansible yep uh me probably about four years three and a half i don't know somewhere in there lost the sands of time yeah so uh today we're talking about automation of migrations yeah so a new thing coming up especially with the cinos out there going into life and really with even cinos cinos 8 going into life a couple of years ago uh, it's been a big talk about how to get people off of their current systems and really at scale, because again, you don't want to have to migrate 10,000 servers by hand. So going into automation of how do you actually make this happen? You know, what do you actually need to look at? What gotchas are there? You know, what paths you need to follow? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and there's there's several schools of thought as far as this stuff goes. And there are some tools that have been developed, right? So you have, um, I've done a, a couple of demos, blog posts, and I know you've played with it well, kind of the the elevate tool and it essentially what you run this tool it'll kind of evaluate a system it'll take its best guess of hey i think you're going to have a problem here or there it'll try and give you some advice on how to fix that but then you have to fix it yourself and then you try and do the automation process and yeah. cross your fingers and mm -hmm. you know it all works yeah yeah do whatever kind of ritual sure you think you backed up before so. yeah yeah absolutely but it's i mean it's no guarantee right and it's and it's migrating the in-place machine mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily the, um, really the, I would say the recommended yeah. method of doing it. It seems maybe the easiest. It, it can be. I mean, especially if you're going from, you know, the same OS to same OS. But when you start thinking about even migrations of things like Debian over to, you know, a Red Hat based, which in there, you know, that's a completely different host. Packages are different, everything. You have to think of the whole productized portion of it completely different because, Applications are not the same yeah. between architectures. Yeah, architecture is different. Architecture is different. So when you're thinking about automation of these types of things, you have to go into more of the mindset of what is the underlying stuff that I'm actually migrating? What packages are different? You know, do I need a different, you know, architecture underneath? Do I need a completely different, uh, you know, even database? I mean, there's lots of different things in there to think about when you're going. Because, you know, over here, I may stay with MySQL. Over here, I may go very ADB. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm thinking too, like, how do you even start? Like, if you have 10 systems, that'd be not so bad, right? I could probably manage yeah. that. If I have a hundred, that starts getting out of hand. If I have a thousand, yeah. 
So just testing it out, you know, and first identifying what you have. You need to know your systems, what they are, CPU memory, disk, you know, everything about it. Because you, you assume we don't know what you know, most we're people, running. Yeah. Most people out there are really surprised. <laughs> on their systems. A lot of them, they did yeah. build them out ad hoc. Yeah. And, and that's one of the things I usually preach to people is basically when you're automating systems, you know, once you automate building out a system once, you can build that out as many times as you want. So you first have to know how to actually build that system out. And to do that, you have to know what's on there. Once you know what's on that system, build out a template to say, okay, this is the structure. I need these packages here. I need these configuration files. I need these my source files over here. Once you start building that out, you can push that anywhere. You know what really popped into my head is like most of my career, I've done network engineering and network engineers, we live and die by diagrams, right? Like I'm a caveman. I think in pictures, I draw them on the wall even, right? Like I don't know that I could make it to the bathroom uh, without a drawing instructing me how to do that, right? But uh, you spend a lot of your time in, well, I mean, it also is the old joke of, do you have an updated network diagram? Yeah. Of course I do. Um, but and that was one of the things I really preached and harped on just because if you have multiple engineers working, like how do you all share a vision of what things are supposed to be like kind of in the infrastructure world, server world, I know you've done small to extremely large scale. Yeah. What do you guys usually do for like documentation? Was like, is that actually a thing that exists or is it just the system is the documentation? So documentation, well, I try to get, I, I'm a big database person, so I try to get as much information into a database about my systems as possible because then I can view it any way I want. I can build a web page that pulls out particular data for software packages or just basic information about networking, whatever. So as long as I have the information in a consumable fashion, it's just getting the data in there, making sure it's correct and make sure it's always updated. And again, that's where automation comes in. Is there stuff off the shelf that kind of helps you do that? Uh, there's some stuff out there, yeah. Yeah. You like any of it? Not particularly. <laughs> okay. Um, but again, I mean, I do a lot of those things today with Ansible. I use the gather facts, the package module, service yeah. modules, all that to ingest that data so that I know what's there. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the big push, I mean, it it almost seems like pie in the sky dream for a lot of people, especially like on the networking side. And that's like infrastructure or configuration is code, right? Yeah. The idea being... I've got a repository of some sort, you know, it could be, I mean, I've seen people do it as an Excel spreadsheet, Yeah. you know, but it's like, I've got something out there that like maintains files that mm -hmm. says, this is how this thing is supposed to be configured, right? Mm -hmm. Like my infrastructure, it's actually as code. And then I use automation to consume that and then build those things. I mean, if you're doing infrastructure as code as much as you can, right? I mean, that's, that's like, can you envision an environment where that goal is 100% attainable, it's probably impossible, right? Yeah. But if you get, what, like 90% of the way there, that's pretty well documenting your systems, right? Yeah. And, and a lot of people even push it to like Git. So then you have yeah. versioning of it. Yeah. Yeah. So and so you basically, once you know what's there, you then have to figure out, you know, how to get it in a new location. And, and a lot of times, you know, I recommend always building out new. I don't like running a script over here and it just converting it. I build out new because I write the playbooks in Ansible to build the new server so that I only have to do that once. Yeah. So now when I build it over here, if migration two years down the road and our CEO decides we got to move everything to AWS, I can just rebuild it all over there. It's so much easier just to, you know, point it where I want it to go and have it go. I already have the process automated. So I figure out what's on the systems, figure out what I have to do to automate that, to build that out. I write the playbooks. I build it out and basically just copy data over. All right. So yeah. I know in my, well, I mean, current and previous kind of mm -hmm. lives, uh, pretty much everybody I ever talked to was running kind of VMware. Yeah. Right. So it's usually that's my go-to when I'm talking about kind of an example because it, it feels less complex than trying to explain the process in the cloud. Yeah. So I usually like that. So if you could give me, I don't know, 30 seconds, one minute, like what's a basic flow you would follow for doing exactly what you're talking about, like in a VMware environment. I've got, um, I don't know, CentOS 7 box, and I want to throw that on a Rocky 8 or 9. So basically VMware environment, and I'm going again to that same NV VMware environment. I'm basically, I'm first looking at the actual VM itself. You know, how much CPU memory has size of disk. Okay. I want to match that as close as possible. Now you may be doing some takes in here saying, okay, well, we really need to expand the disk or performance wise. We may need more CPU or memory. I, I try not to do that during the migration period. 
I try to just do like for like. So that way I know they're exactly the same. I can go back and re-reference those as possible. And then that way also I can test performance before and after and say, hey, are we performing about the same after the move? Yeah. Because if I throw two more CPUs over here or more memory over here and say that the performance is still bad, I don't know what's causing yeah, that. Yeah. And I like, I really like the idea of, because I learned this the hard way, limiting the number of variables you're changing at once. Yeah. I mean, you're already changing a lot of stuff. Yeah. So why not keep as much of it the same as possible? Yeah. I basically, I, I do like for like and the performance test both of them, this one beforehand and that one afterwards. Make sure we're actually kind of looking at the same effect. Um, once I've seen the VM and I get the new one built out, I get the new OS installed on there that I want. It's basically just looking at the application server and saying, okay, what is on here? What right. makes this server unique? And taking that and saying, okay, this makes it unique that I have JBoss installed on it and I have all these other packages installed on it. And then I either write a playbook or, you know, if I'm crunched for time and there's only a couple of servers, I install all that stuff over here and get that looking the same. I then say, okay, well, what's all the data I have? I copy the data over there, and then I start doing my testing across them and say, okay, is everything functional, first of all? My applications still work. If not, you know, over here, I may need a couple of additional packages, you know, install that, and then I make that kind of my template of this is what I need to do to build this type of application because I may have 10,000 servers in my environment, but I may only have 100 or so actual applications. Like, they're all basically the same. Right. You know, it may have different data on them, maybe different configuration files, but you know, the JBoss server here, JBoss server there. Right. And this process is the assumption of, I'm not already doing configuration as code on this. Yeah. Because if you already have config oh, yeah, code, yeah. it's like... Yeah, then you, this whole process is already done for you. Yeah, it's pretty much already done. Because it doesn't matter if you're going from, what, like CentOS 7 mm -hmm. to Rocky 9, you could be going Rocky 8 to Rocky 9. Yeah. You could be going another vendor over mm -hmm. to Rocky 9. Like it doesn't... Yeah. It really super doesn't matter, which I think is cool. So we're doing that process. We're going through, what are some of the gotchas or caveats you think you might run into? One that I was thinking is, um, say you're doing CentOS 7, you've got some kind of application that's running mm -hmm. and maybe in Rocky 9, they've changed the format of the config files. It's like yeah. you can't just copy the config file off and push right. Like it's going to be something you'll have to look for there. Like what other kind of caveats can you think of? Uh, that'll be different a lot. Some places move stuff around. So oh. things will be in different places. Yeah, just literally store it in a different yeah, spot. Yeah, literally just store it in a different place. Uh, you'll have things as far as, and you know, like package names may be different or your package aren't even, aren't even available for that version. Oh. So like that, like this application has been deprecated mm -hmm. and you got to move it to something. Yeah, now you got to figure out, okay, what I got to do to get it on the, the new new thing. Or you may, I mean, if you're going from even like a Debian to a, uh, you know, a Rocky Nine. Then you're looking at okay. Well, over here I installed a Apache Apache process or package. Over here is HCB. Even package names are different. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems like you get hairy pretty quick. Yeah. Well, also, you know, like um, it's something I know we've talked about before in the past on migrations and things like that. Is, um, you know, maybe for some reason on this one system, you've got something installed and running, and it absolutely doesn't need to be there. Yeah. Right. Like, I guess part of the process too is. How do I, I guess, evaluate my systems? What needs to be there? What doesn't need to be there? And then, you know, some mm -hmm. intelligent process needs to go through and like decide what actually yeah. is required there. But, and you have other things to consider too, it's just security wise. Yeah. You know, you got to make sure you don't have additional packages on there, especially services and other things that are open to the network that are unnecessary. That's one of the things I do on my network is basically I don't, even though I, I, I have minimal installs, they're even more minimal than the minimal install. I build my own custom minimal CD and rip out just tons of stuff that don't need to be there by default. First of all, it doesn't need to be there, but also it saves me time and stuff when I'm doing updates. You know, like on a server, why do I need 15 wireless drivers on a server? <laughs> I mean, those packages don't need to be there. Yeah. They'll remove those all. Yeah. So, I mean, I try to get my servers to slim down. Again, this moves you to like the, even the container conversation you just get me as slim down as possible to where only the stuff i need is on there and that way i can guarantee there's no other security issues but also there's nothing else on there causing performance issues so something else that popped in my head is like you were talking about building you know a slim down image or whatever and normally we're okay. talking about vmware or i mean you yeah. cloud you know people are going to say build a golden image yeah right and so i mean i think there's different schools of thought here you can have a golden image that is the basest most base mm -hmm. and then 
If I'm building a database server, I'll tweak it in these ways. I'll add these things. If I'm building a web server, I might tweak it. Like, at what point do you think it makes sense to have just a base golden image that everything's built off of, or you have multiple kind of base images for, say, this is my database, and it's got very specific requirements. I mean, where do you... Because I know Ansible is happy to do pretty much yeah. anything. Like, like where do you think you kind of fall in? I fall in the, the multiple base images line. So I have a base image that's just a minimal, nothing else. Okay. And then I have base images for different application servers, for different database servers. And most of that is not because I, I want that golden image. Because again, Ansible will build it exactly how I want it, yeah. exactly the same yeah. every single time. It's just time, time saving. Because what I have is I have application servers that, you know, if one of them goes down, I can redeploy that based upon my kind of golden image for that server and get it back up and running. You know, instead of trying to figure out what is wrong with that server, if I'm having an issue with it, whatever, I can deploy another one and get it up and running within three minutes, especially on VMware with Mate. my, uh, uh, what do they call it now? Linked my, image? Yeah, linked images. Yes. Yeah. Uh, with my linked images, I can get that up in three minutes and have my production back up and running, segregate that server off, go figure out what's wrong with it then. But if I was to try to use Ansible to build it all out from scratch again, you know, it's going to be 10, 15 minutes, depending on when I'm installing it, just because some of the installers go real slow. Yeah. And I guess, like, if it's one machine, maybe not that bad, but if it's a cluster of machines, yeah. you're compounding that type. Although it can run a lot of those in parallel, right? But it's still going to add some mm -hmm. processing time and all that. That absolutely makes sense. Yeah. And and again, things are different in cloud versus VMware too. Yeah. You know, yeah. In cloud, you're going, generally, I don't do custom AMIs and stuff in cloud. I'm going off of what's there. That way they're keeping that up to date. Have to. Yeah. 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 Uh, but on my VMware side, since I do have a VMware environment, my, I have Ansible playbooks that go and convert my templates back to VMs, update them, rerun my security hardening, everything, and shut them back down pretty much every uh, two weeks just so they're all kind of up to date. Yeah. Turn them back into templates. Yes. That's a really, that's a cool feature that you taught me not that long ago that you have a template, say, oh, actually make this a VM and then turn it back into a template. So mm -hmm. you can't actually do those tweaks and tunes without having to go through a whole lot of operating. Yeah. I, I granted, I do have a couple of templates I don't keep on, up to date on purpose. That's just because yeah. of my Ansible demos. I want to show updates. Up yeah, yeah. And if they're always <laughs> up to date, it's hard to show doing Linux updates on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have some for the exact same reason. So it purposely kept out of date. Yeah. Yeah, or like when we're demoing like LTS, you know, you have to have like a base 8.6. Yeah. If you're doing 8.6 LTS to be able to demo that stuff. That oh. makes sense. Uh, I guess the last portion you really got to keep eye on when you're doing migrations is basically application connectivity. So basically, if I'm mi migrating a database over, I may want to migrate the application servers that utilize that database all at the same time. So then I can run both clusters over here. Because otherwise, say I, I migrate an application server over where its settings in here are still pointing back to the other right. database. My testing over here is still pointing back to that. So I kind of want to have that full application set over there so I can really test the performance on the new infrastructure. Yeah, something I was thinking is you were talking earlier about uh, limiting the number of variables. You change it once, you're changing mm -hmm. two things. But you've already tested this in your test environment. Yes. Right? You already have full confidence. Yeah. I, well, what's, what's I, the I do the same process in my dev environments first. Yeah. This is how I migrate. So. I was gonna say, what's the uh, what's the old um, what's the old joke? Everybody's got a a test network. Not everybody's got a production one. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll have some kind of little side area where you can experiment. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I, you know what? I, it's probably a little bit more difficult to people in the cloud because there is a cost associated with that. Right. Yeah. You're you're paying to have this stuff on and do all that. And well, the good thing about it, especially when you're testing stuff to see if it's work, is. You can spin that up and test it pretty quickly and tear it back down afterwards. Yeah. Because now that you have the playbooks and stuff to do this migration, you can be testing it over and over. You don't have to spin that up and leave it sitting for days while then you figure out some issue. You can tear that back down and save that money. And the testing part also can be automated. And yeah. well, I'm not saying can, should be automated. Yes. Because it's going to extend beyond just your migration, right? If you have a testing mechanism, uh, you get to utilize that every time you, you know, day two provision a new machine yeah. or... I don't know, maybe even like in the troubleshooting process. Because mm -hmm. think about like, I'm building this testing suite. Um, say I'm onboarding a new engineer, like a junior engineer. I don't necessarily want them to be able to turn all the knobs on my machines. Yeah. But if they get called at two in the morning, I also don't want them waking me up. So I can put all this testing stuff in a mm -hmm. format available, like using a sender, right? Yeah. With role-based access control, I can say, hey, this joker gets access to these things. They can run all this. And then it spits out a message that says, don't wake up Greg. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And one of the other benefits of doing the migration itself, we didn't really touch on, is the fact that, again, once you get this automated, you can do it pretty much anywhere, but it allows you more to kind of make all your servers the same. You know, because they oh, start off, you know, if you just built us thousands of servers and they're all snowflakes, you have a thousand snowflakes, you got to care for each one. Whereas you can move to building templatized systems where all my JBoss servers look the same, all my database servers look the same. They're all in the same format. I have files in the same location. So it fixes all your issues of configuring backups and everything else because you always know where stuff is. I know my source files are here. I know my configuration files are there. You know, and I can deploy this very easy. And any, if, you know, the application team comes and says, hey, we need a new application server, you already know how to actually deploy that out. Yeah. This could be good for the compliance team or yes. any auditing, any of that stuff you have. You know, you're going to be able to truly confidently say, hey, all these things look the same. Yeah. So when you say snowflakes, do you think most of the snowflakes are, like, say I've got like 10 JBoss servers, do you think it's snowflakes in like the configuration files or the way they're formatted? Or do you think it's like, Oh, I just built this system at this time frame and it ended up having this this default package, this application was installed. And then this one came on six months later. And for whatever reason, when I install it, this other app, I mean, is it just weird stuff like that? It could be like that, but it could also be, you know, even the company uh, requirements change. You mm-hmm. know, yeah. the security team may have put new implementations out there and you built all your new systems with that, but all your old systems don't have it. That's true. You know, and it can be, you know, our application team had some special stuff they needed. So, you know, you did that and went and did it all manually, but you don't know about that for future. So having kind of that standard where this is how we build it out and even go into your application developers and say, hey, this is how we build out the machines. You know, you kind of got to fit within this framework. If you need something extra, you know, we can work with you to add it on, but this is our framework. So they know what their kind of, I guess, limitations you would say is mm. or the box they got to play in. Yeah. I think it's cool too. like, just thinking about writing the automation to actually do this stuff, kind of, you step back mm-hmm. a little bit uh, on the migration piece. You know, if I'm, say for example, I'm migrating a JBoss. Well, I mean, I have to grab the configs, I have to grab the data, I have to move them to the new place. And once I have that process, it's probably going to be extremely similar for like every application, oh, right? So they're all pretty much the same. Yeah. So once you, once you build up your I'll say template for lack of a better term right. here. Once you build up your template for doing JBoss, why well, get to copy and paste that? Just make a few tweaks. And now mm-hmm. I've got my, you know, my Apache or my, yeah. you know, you fill in the blank sort of thing, which I think is pretty cool. And then also part of those pieces, um, you know, the, the first half where you're like copying it and pulling it, you don't necessarily need to reuse, but the taking it from some repository and pushing it, now that becomes your config as code push yes, for these services. Right. So it's like, you're killing two birds with one stone right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that's awesome. A good leave behind, right? So it's the thing I I don't like always in automation, like uh, thinking about doing, because there's this time sink, right? It's like, uh, do I automate this? And if I do, am I going to get to reuse this? Or am I just automating to do it one time? And how long will it take me to write the automation? Would it be right. faster for me to just manually do it, right? But this, you're not wasting any of those cycles, mm-hmm. right? One, you're getting reps, which is like, especially if you're new to automation, you need reps, you just yeah. need practice. But two, I get to reuse this moving forward, like for the foreseeable future for all of us. Well, also the automation piece, maybe I'm going CentOS 7 to CentOS or um, to Rocky 9 right now. Mm-hmm. Well, five years from now, maybe I'm going Rocky 9 to Rocky 10 and I get yeah. to just reuse the same sort of stuff. I just point it back to hosts. Yep. It's exactly. all the way automations. That's pretty cool. Any, uh, any final words on uh, migration? Any no. thoughts? Whatever you do, you know, figure out what you got. Figure out how to automate it, and it'll make your life way easier in the future. Yeah, for sure. And I do have some closing thoughts. Uh, if you are having problems, you do maybe need some help, assistance with all that stuff. These people you see here on camera, we are happy to help you assist in those things. Definitely. Not only with setting up the automation platform itself, but guess what? We can do professional services and actually help you come in and build this automation stuff with some lead behinds, which is going to be pretty nice. So um, sometimes it helps just to get jump started, right? Like Mm -hmm. have somebody help you get the plane in the air and then you can steer it after that. We're happy to help with all that stuff. Well, you're the experts. We're here to help. Oh, he is the expert. (laughs) He's talking, when he says we, he's talking about him and the voices in his head. Uh, Not me. I'm just, I play one on TV. So yeah, don't be fooled. All right. So thanks everybody. And I guess 
Uh, this is a podcast, correct? I'm shaking. This guy over here shaking his head. Uh, so hopefully you uh, tune in next time. Watch all the rest of them. And uh, definitely drop in the comments that we are your favorite host and that we should definitely do more of this. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you.